Uh, my name is Jakub Janda. I'm director of European Value Center for Security Policy, uh, headquartered in Prague, Czech Republic, but we are opening our office in Taipei soon. Uh, so let me welcome you to our next uh, European Values uh, talk. We will actually really speak about uh, EU-Taiwan cooperation because there are many positive developments in this area. Uh, we will actually talk mainly about countering disinformation, where the EU is actually doing uh, many things. There are EU member states and organizations organizations uh, on national level working a lot and there are also members of the European Parliament ta talking and working against this information both from Russia and from China but there's also foreign policy cooperation because uh, clearly China is pressuring uh, the democratic country of Taiwan and uh, there seems to be a lot of political developments on the EU side uh, especially within the European Parliament which is the most active EU body on cooperating and supporting Taiwan uh, so today for in the next uh, approximately 60 minutes, we will speak uh, with two distinguished uh, guests and speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, a, a member of European Parliament, uh, elected from the Czech Republic, Marketa Gregorova. Marketa, good to see you. Uh, Marketa will actually, she represents the, the Green Group. She actually comes from the Czech Pirate Party. Uh, and uh, Marketa is actually very active within the European Parliament because uh, she actually is, uh, I would say, leading a leading voice on uh, disinformation technology or counter surveillance activities uh, and she's been working a lot on Russia and uh, she does a lot on China and Taiwan um, so she will speak about that in a second uh, and our second speaker who will connect in, in, a, in a few seconds as well is Puma Shen uh, Puma is the chairman of Double Think Lab a leading think tank in Taiwan on countering Chinese disinformation so Puma will join us in a second as well uh, so I would maybe uh, slowly start uh, uh, with, with our questions, but uh, I will first ask our panelists, I will first ask Marketa to, to speak and then Puma when he connects, uh, but we will have Q&A, so if there are questions which the audience would like to uh, uh, get answered, uh, so please you could uh, ask the questions on YouTube uh, where we are actually broadcasting th this discussion, so if you put it into comments, uh, you, could, uh, you could actually get the questions here my colleagues will get them here to me and we will actually ask the speakers about that as well uh, so I would slowly ask uh, Marketo uh, if I may jump and uh, and ask you directly uh, you've been working a lot uh, within the EU as a member of the European Parliament on disinformation you started to work I would say mainly on Russia in recent years so could you basically please tell us a bit about what you've been doing on Russian disinformation and how does it connect to Chinese disinformation which is is pretty much connected to the issue of Taiwan and its, its, its security as well. Of course. Of course. Oh no. Oh, no. Uh, there is still uh, the, still the and I do how, how to resolve, resolve, that. resolve that. Maybe, maybe can you switch, can you off, switch your, off your mic. All right. Oh, amazing. Okay, I was so afraid that uh, uh, we will have this kind of technical problem. But no, thank you very much for your very nice introduction. And also thank you to all listeners and uh, everybody who is participating today. Uh, and I will be happy to also uh, see soon my, uh, my co-speaker. Uh, well, as for the topic of disinformation, I need to first uh, establish myself in some position within the European Parliament's body. Uh, and currently I am the coordinator of uh, the INGE committee. And the INGE committee is a special committee uh, for foreign interference and uh, hybrid threats, especially disinformation. It has a longer name, but uh, I, I usually shorten it like this. And uh, as the coordinator, I uh, participated mostly at establishing what the committee should do and what it should focus on, because originally uh, it uh, had quite a narrow scope and I am happy to actually say that we managed to broaden it and uh, we managed to firstly invite plenty of very uh, esteemed guests and speakers. Jakub was actually among them <laughs> and uh, uh, we listened to them intently about uh, their expertise 
and experience with the topic. And uh, based on that, and not only that, also on uh, research and uh, papers that we uh, ask the Parliament's bodies to, uh, to present to us, uh, we are drafting now, uh, let's say, a file or a paper of our committee, which will be the result of our two years existence and which will pretty much uh, set what we as the European Parliament want in terms of fight against disinformation and foreign interference uh, from the Commission, which has the legislative initiat initiative, of course. And uh, well, this is, uh, of course, progressing. And as for the uh, Russian and Chinese foreign interference and disinformation activities, uh, I have to say in this regard, it's never separated. They just have different goals they want to achieve through what they are doing. However, uh, uh, all these countries, and not only these two, but let's talk mostly about them, uh, are countries that are interfering in the European Union, either in democracy, in society, or directly in elections. And so what we uh, focus on is the reasons behind it, uh, why Russia, why China has any kind of uh, any kind of ambition to actually interfere here, and uh, how to counter it, of course, and what methods they are using because that also vastly differs. Um, maybe I d won't go into detail now because I was supposed to just describe what we do about it, but it is really uh, important to mark that uh, there are different ways and methods how these countries are interfering. Uh, and we might be actually more, let's say, you might, uh, you, you who are listening right now, more familiar with uh, the Russian because they are a little bit more uh, visible, let's say. However, the Chinese are uh, also present and uh, well they they use just different methods but now i will also you know given that my clique uh came i will also give the floor uh to, to you thanks thanks thank you marketo uh i will maybe follow up and then i will give the floor to puma puma you hear us fine right good to see you well, good. So I will uh, have a follow up question to Marketa first. Uh, you uh, you spoke about the disinformation what part of the work which you do, uh, but also you are a member of the European Parliament whose planner is uh, just voted on a major report on uh, on Taiwan, uh, which is more foreign policy, but also involves foreign policy, security, business, and other relations. So could you please a bit comment on? what the report is about how it actually came into into place because what seems to amazing to me is that what a broad political support it got because european parliament is a political body there are political fights as usual as it should be uh, but on the on the taiwan report there was i think only about about 30 members of the european parliament against that from 750 plus so it's a huge political support so could you comment on how it actually happened of course uh, well, firstly, of course, I will mention also that it's the it's a first report only about EU Taiwan relations from the European Parliament. So really, it's a, it's a huge thing, and I am happy for it. Well, how it happened? There are uh, certain aspects. Um, I will mention. I think the mo biggest ones, that doesn't mean that there weren't, you know, other aspects included. Uh, but the biggest ones are uh, that, uh, you know, this is not as much a change or shift in the EU policy as we saw the shift in the Chinese diplomacy and policy towards the EU. And uh, there is no denying that it's becoming more aggressive, uh, more, uh, let's say, even uh, open about uh, uh, hostile intentions or, or open hostility and we are seeing this uh, not only on the eu level but in uh, individual national states you know uh, of course we coming from the czech republic know very much about chinese threats to our democracy and to our representatives and this doesn't really miss the eye of the eu representatives and of the meps and uh, let's not forget about the fact that a couple of uh, MEPs, uh, me not being included yet, unfortunately, uh, has been uh, uh, banned by uh, by the Chinese authorities, and this just doesn't, uh, you know, uh, doesn't shout um, uh, tolerance and. Uh, uh, let's say, how to call it, uh, a communication uh, that works and uh, uh, that they want to 
sorry, that they want to work on uh, our partnership and relations. Whereas on the other hand, we also see, and this is, I think, the second biggest reason that uh, uh, Taiwan is becoming uh, and is already uh, quite uh, the uh, you know advanced technologically advanced democracy and uh, let's not pretend uh, we are to some extent also uh, dependent on its production of for example microchips etc and considering that you know for a very long time let's not you know, uh, uh, let's put it very bluntly, the EU kind of um, depend, depended on its uh, on Taiwanese uh, silicon shield. However, uh, this is slightly breaking up as uh, the Chinese really prioritize its autonomy in this field. And I think that the EU just uh, sees it and realizes that uh, now we need to build other shields, not silicon shields, but also, you know, human shields and uh, real partnerships. So that is also why the report talks about bilateral investment agreements. It slightly touches upon the possibility of further agreements. It doesn't immediately say free trade agreement, but you know it's uh, it's something that's quite obvious that it goes in that direction. And well, in general, who reads it just see clear uh, support of the Taiwanese democracy and uh, Taiwanese people. And even so, of course, the European Parliament still continues to talk about the EU's One China policy. There are also starting to be raised voices uh, that this might be also uh, rethought, rethink. And uh, um, well, we, we'll see about it. I, I won't go into detail now. The, 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 the report doesn't talk about it. Thank you, Marketa. I personally hope that one day we will have one Taiwan policy as well. Uh, but that's what I can say since I'm not a state representative. So I'm, I hope that that's, that will change in the future. Uh, if I would go to Puma now, uh, Puma, you are actually a leader within the Taiwanese community on countering Chinese disinformation and also political influence as well. Uh, so I am very happy that you could be here with us today because uh, there, there are there, there there will be more cooperation between European democracies and the Taiwanese democracy uh, on the political level, but also on the civil society level, which is pretty much interconnected. Uh, so I would first maybe ask you if you could tell us more about how is actually Taiwan standing up uh, or staying against the pressure of Chinese government-led disinformation against Taiwan. Uh, if you could mm -hmm. please tell us a bit a, a bit about how it will how it looks like, because you have a great team within Double Think Lab here. Uh, in Taipei, uh, which is working against that. Uh, and then we'll discuss more of what, what could be done together in the future. So Puma, floor is yours, please. <laughs> sure. Thanks for having me today. So, I mean, today I'll like, use like a framework I previously like researched and, and kind of introduce how we encounter this information in a like systematic way. So I think in thinking about like a general disinformation campaign, there are like four points that should be addressed. So first, there must be adversaries that operate either intentionally or recklessly. And second, there must be misleading content. Third, there are channels that spread disinformation. And less people truly, there are victims that truly believe in disinformation. So which means that disinformation impact is significant. So I, I think in thinking about how to counter disinformation, we can use these four points as guidelines to decide which approach we should apply. So some may say that the best way to stop this information is to engage in the adversaries. However, it is kind of difficult to identify all these attackers. And one might violate freedom of speech while um, doing this because it's necessary to prove the intent. And there's one exception here, you see, if we can compare the writing style. So if we know who the adversaries are, we may calculate with some new technology their writing style in order to disclose the origin of the disinformation. And we can talk about that later. But no matter how we investigate, we still need a law to investigate as well. And also, some we may want to focus on the content. But disinformation includes information such as the conspiracy theories. 
So I think it's extremely difficult to debunk conspiracy theories and since there's no evidence to prove their authenticity. So, I mean, focusing on the content is not a good strategy for countering this information. And you know, there are, especially China, they really love fake posts that pretend to support the government and further complicate the process. And some may say we want to focus on specific channels like Facebook and Twitter. And it seems like a good idea since one can focus on the behavior, but not the content. And the last one is the victim orientation approach. So if there are no victims, it seems unnecessary to look into this information. But if I mean defining the victims, it's not an easy task. So I mean, from 2018 to till now, companies like Facebook focus a lot on coordinated inauthentic behavior. So they focus a lot on the channel. And the non-government organizations here in Taiwan focus a lot on the citizens, the victims themselves. And what the communist government did is separate, is separate from this and the topic I'll introduce later. So I discussed different channels that spread and amplify this information right now, initiated by China to Taiwan. So talk about how to identify them and review like both victims and how can we counter this information. I think I can finish that in, in several minutes, I guess. <laughs> so, so originally, all these attackers could easily approach uh, Taiwanese local citizens and ask them to circulate rumors face to face. But this is not necessary now since it's much easier to, for them to circulate information online. So because of this, when we talk about combating disinformation, we should distinguish between online or offline disinformation. So when we look at the online disinformation, we can include like Weibo, WeChat, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all these public forums. But how information spreads through this medium is different than how it spreads offline. So I think it's crucial to establish an appropriate model to explain how. So according to my research, Chinese departments such as the PLA, the army, or the groups like the Communist Youth of League, they are more responsible for the online disinformation on YouTube or Facebook. And other departments like the United Front Work Department or the CPPCC are accountable for both online and offline disinformation. The Central Committee there in China is likely to organize both online and offline disinformation in order to initiate effective attacks. And I think, I mean, according to our research, they may organize this and have a meeting every, like say three months. So from our side, we should categorize all these channels that spread this information and use different strategies for each. So the first one is that the information manipulation directly manipulated by Chinese uh, attack or Chinese actors. So if, we're in, if we were encountering information manipulation, that is the responsibility of Chinese actors. I think transparency is the key because this kind of disinformation attacks might be derived from China, Chinese propaganda department or the patriots, the online keyboard warriors. And these agents of propaganda or trolls are all visible online. And there's really no need to fight it since the information is from foreign countries and is overt and easy for the government to debunk it. So therefore, when we talk about transparency, we should be careful about the type of attack involved. If an attack is directly from the propaganda department, one should disclose the origin of the certain messages and let the audience render judgment. And if it is from cyber warriors like the little pink, disclosing the origin does not make any sense. So in this way, what should be disclosed is the anomaly itself. For example, this uh, would involve telling the public that there are too many similar messages produced by inauthentic accounts or authentic patriots. So in this way, we're telling the public that the volume of internet messages is abnormal, not the source of anonymous accounts that are difficult to check. So in this way, we're stressing the importance of abnormality, not the importance of the source itself. So for example, China and people like in Cambodia, uh, just like several months ago, created lots of fan pages with only few followers recently. But each post could get more than 100 shares with no likes. So the, cy the cyber army will automatically share the messages to Facebook groups to make sure people would see them. And they're not actually from the propaganda department. So the way to counter it is to stress what went wrong on the internet instead of delving into the topic they want you to engage. And there are like uh, another kinds of connected level disinformation in this type of uh, information manipulation, but I can, I, I can guess, I can introduce them later during the Q and A. So the second one I think is more tricky is that because China is very good at to, uh, to invest in the disinformation market. So in this case, we will need to disclose more. There are three kinds of investment in a disinformation campaign initiated by China. 
The first one is the foreign actors could directly donate or sponsor certain groups uh, in Taiwan that are capable of spreading, spreading this information. So for example, the local newspaper circulated for free in Taiwan has been proven to have connections to uh, Chinese actors. This type of investment is overt and direct. And to counter this, one needs to disclose the type of investment involved, which usually relates to United Front Work Department. And the second one, uh, the second kind of investment is that when the Chinese actors invest in different domains not related to this information that can later but be utilized to spread this information, like the gaming industry, the live stream industry, they're often invested by China. And all these live streamers, actors, or even singers could spread this information through the industry if necessary. So this is not easy to identify since it is covert and causality is hard to prove. Relying on, I mean, relying on the public's judgment might be the only way to identify when this kind of disinformation campaign is present. And the last kind, I think, is the, I think it's the biggest threat uh, that we're facing right now involves how Chinese actors try to establish the disinformation market. So this includes the use of content prompts and the markets to attract rent seekers. For example, in 2019, just right before the election here in Taiwan, the presidential election, among the top 10 YouTubers who received donations online in Taiwan, seven of them spread pro-China messages. And actually, the top one YouTuber got only 70,000 subscribers, but attracted more than a million NT dollars per year. And another example is that China tries to pay fan pages or private uh, Facebook groups to disseminate the articles and pay for them in foreign currency. So in one of the groups I actually joined, people can make actually 1,500 USD dollars per month by simply disseminating pro-China articles in Taiwan. So I think to fight this last kind of disinformation spread, which I believe is the most complicated one, there must be ways to investigate the money flow in order to determine the impact of foreign actors. And that's why, I mean, all the countries, I mean, in the world should join this. I mean, to, should join this because uh, the money flows from internationally. And it is much more plausible to let the public know whether the information has been compromised. So transparency is the key here, but it is extremely difficult without appropriate investigation. So one needs to follow who registered the website, who established the platform, and who donates the money. And the last one I want to mention here is that sometimes the money is not necessary because Chinese actors can also establish the ideology market, which attracts certain groups of people who are cynical and have received incentives to criticize the government. In this case, we're approaching the core of freedom of speech and should be careful not to violate it. So people tend to believe what they want to believe and try to share the content that is biased or misleading generated by China. So punishment will not make this, will only make the scenario worse. So in that case, transparency will not be the key, key there. And we should focus on the victims who consume and believe in the rumors. So here, the non-government groups or non-government organizations here in Taiwan were trying to help in the case when the victims voluntarily being affected by this kind of Chinese disinformation. The first thing we should do is to determine which groups of people are most vulnerable. According to our research, there are like several personality, we actually uh, categorize them. There are like four different kinds of personality types that are prone to consume Chinese disinformation. So for example, when disinformation triggers their negative emotions or circulate frequently in the chat apps like WhatsApp, line here is, is similar to, the, to, to WhatsApp, or by word of mouth among people with no specific political affiliation. This has more impact uh, than this information being widely discussed in the mainstream media. And this does not mean they're stupid. It only means that they have been targeted. So in this case, if transparency does not work, we move to the debunk, uh, we try to move to the debunking process. If certain personalities are involved, then we prioritize that kind of debunk, uh, that kind of messages and prioritize the debunking procedure. So uh, another one of the experiments I conducted last year also determined that people ages 20 to 29 here in Taiwan are most vulnerable to the disinformation China produces. So youngsters who are apolitical are also vulnerable, although they do not really buy into pro-China messages. Anti-US, anti-Japan messages are very popular right now here in Taiwan and seem to attract them in a very significant way. So I briefly introduced that how uh, China uh, initiates all these attacks to Taiwan and just a very brief idea like how non-government non or non-profit organization, how we encounter it. And maybe during the uh, Q&A, I can talk about how Taiwanese government uh, have done 
against all this disinformation campaign. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Puma. Uh, Marketo, I would like to ask you if you could comment on what Puma actually said, because he was basically describing how the civil society in Taiwan responds. And uh, you, Marketo, have, a, I think, extensive experience from first within the European Union, but also you've been working, I would say, with uh, some of the, let's say, entities in Georgia, which is facing a lot of Russian disinformation, and also a domestic one, which government in Georgia actually uses against its own civil society quite often for, for in a political sense. So um, is there something where you see some similarities, for example, or something what do you think might be interesting for, let's say, us in Europe, what we could learn potentially? Uh, thank you, firstly, Puma, for uh, for this uh, briefing. I think it could have been uh, like even for several hours, and it would still be, you know, full of very important information. But uh, thank you for uh, comprising it. Um, I would start actually not with uh, similarities, but with differences, because what I found very interesting is uh, the attempts to really poison the youth. And I will really say this, the word poison, because honestly, and now talking uh, academically, uh, this is very smart way from the Chinese government uh, to, to deal with that, because uh, the new generations are always the ones who are uh, you know, holding the hope or the beacon of hope uh, and uh, also, let's say, the more uh, uh, more careful approach towards what's uh, really being, you know, shared on the internet and in the online world. So attacking them uh, through various means is something where I can honestly say that, uh, you know, attackers or uh, those who are interfering within Europe or even Georgia have not yet reached. Uh, mostly it's because uh, it's Russia and Russia has quite different uh, ways to approach this. Uh, I, I don't want to simplify it, you know, too much, uh, but I would say that uh, Russian interference in disinformation works a lot with quantity, uh, not with really quality or targeting, you know, and it's slightly changing to some extent, of course, they are also targeting vulnerable groups. However, uh, the youth is definitely not considered to be vulnerable group, therefore it is even less targeted. However, here it's really strategical decision. So I find it very interesting interesting and alarming to to be honest because uh, uh I, I don't think that uh, you know that many people focus on the youth and of course i would be happy to also hear more on how maybe the uh, taiwanese schooling system in this uh, regard works you know and how are they educated in this regard um and uh, yeah and as for the uh, similarities well uh Maybe I, I I can't really talk that about uh, about Georgia in terms of similarities because as I mentioned there are very different uh, goals and therefore even very different influences. Uh, what actually uh, you know China uh, tries to do in Taiwan is to really uh, change it so much uh, uh, or change the narrative within Taiwan so much uh, that uh, there won't be a real opposition to ones they will try to you know really take over however in georgia sometimes it kind of seems like russia is not even trying to uh, take over georgia even though they are occupying them uh, as to test what it can do uh, what works and what they can actually do without uh, interference from the EU on the US, you know, uh, and then of course apply it within the EU or within Ukraine or other other uh, states that they prioritize on their on their list. And unfortunately, Taiwan is on the priority list of China uh, too high, you know. But uh, in terms of similarities, and this will be my last remark uh, to this, and similarities to to what is happening in the EU. Well, uh, we can definitely see the same patterns, uh, the same trying to build narratives about what China does to us, you know, or uh, to our nations, how it invests, how it saves, you know, especially in the pandemic, I think it has been most visible. Otherwise, it's quite subtle, you know, it's mostly 
influencing the academia, you know, trying to interfere. But in the pandemic, it was very visible how uh, we could see in Italy, especially at the beginning, how uh, China has been portrayed as not the one who kind of caused the pandemic, uh, but the one who saves everyone from it, you know, sending uh, sending uh, respiratory masks and sending help, etc. Uh, even though, for example, it, uh, it wasn't a, of a good quality or uh, the uh, authorities have to pay for <laughs> the supplies. Um, but uh, this is what made it into news, into blog posts, of course, and this is what really uh, flooded the internet. Well, maybe luckily for the EU, there is still the language barrier, uh, so there is not such a vast uh, uh, vast uh, push and influence uh, because not all the countries in EU uh, speak English uh, or well it's definitely not a mother language of most and uh, uh, so, so there is really a language barrier because if it's trying to just you know something like Google translate the messages of course usually it's uh, it, it doesn't really make sense but uh, these patterns are definitely there. And of course, the language barriers will, even with the rise of AI and improving of the translations and maybe even, you know, uh, paying people in these countries to, to spread some narratives, this will, this will dissolve these, these differences. Thank you, Marketo. Puma, please could you maybe comment on maybe what Marketa hinted, which was basically the media literacy question and let's say the government or state response in Taiwan, because I think that's a big part of a European discussion as well. What should be the role of a state and government authorities and what should only the civil society do because of how liberal democratic we are, we really want to make sure that the government doesn't overreach into personal freedoms as well. So that's a big discussion which you are having in Taipei as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I totally agree that, I mean, media literacy is the key right now, but sometimes it's really hard for them to, I mean, it's, it, it's not mean that education, but because all these messages has been tailored to their needs and to their preference. So sometimes it's really hard to tell the teenagers not to believe in something they just say it on TikTok or even on Weibo or WeChat. It's very hard for them. So, I mean, and as you may know that all these things, information, some, some of them might be true. It's just with misleading title or in a very biased way. So I just give you like a brief example. When I uh, did a survey here you know, for the college students and asking them whether we got this information from foreign countries, only I think 64% of them said yes. But when I asked them like which country is giving us all this, this information and they can check it, we have the country list. Only 34% of them said China. And 20% of them said the US and 20% of them said Japan. So, I mean, on this team, I mean, there are like at least, I mean, 30% of them thinking of like US and Japan are the main actors that having this information and put it in Taiwanese society. So, there has been really influenced by all this content from articles or YouTube channels that actually generated by, um, by China. So, I think. I think for the efforts that were, because you're asking about how Taiwanese government did. So because we're focused a lot on the behavior or the abnormality online and some groups here, I, I know there's a, a, there are like at least four groups, four different groups here in Taiwan. They focus a lot on the victims and they're having like more than 300 workshops per year and telling people not reading all these articles with no authority, with, with no author. And there's a group of people also in Taiwan focus a lot on United Front work money flow. So, I mean, the role of the Taiwanese government, however, I think is another story. Because the approaches here is, um, first of all, our government has its own approach that fight fake news, but not disinformation. So the so-called Taiwanese model does not actually involve cooperation among the government and groups, but instead involves a decoupling process that generates the framework of trust. So because there's no public, no, no, no typical public-private partnership, so civil society tries to keep adequate distance from the government because we need really want to gain trust from the public. So if you're working with the government, people might say that, hey, you're working for the government, you're part of the propaganda. And so such practices help civil society actors earn the trust of the general public in terms of independence and integrity. So helping the eliminate the baseless suspicions about these actors being part of the propaganda approach. So there's like Taiwan Fact Check Center and MyGoPen. They're all uh, both Taiwanese third party fact checkers. 
They have developed online tools available on social media platforms that help people distinguish the facts from fake news. So such efforts has helped improve digital media literacy that you just mentioned. And as a result, the majority of Taiwanese uh, express that they feel more united than before, uh, before the outbreak of COVID-19, according to the survey by the, the Pew Research Center this year. So I think all this might work because um, people can find their own trusted uh, non-profit or non-profit uh, uh, non-profit groups or non-profit organizations will help them to debunk all these messages. However, all these are all targeting fake news, not disinformation. So if we're talking about like framing or the biased or misleading content, there's nothing really we can do uh, through this kind of process. So, uh, so also all these civil society actors that could be utilized by the government. So on, only a few civil society organizations um, uh, choose to closely interact with the public sector. So, but when there is no, pop, no typical public and private partnership and the civil society and the government become loosely coupled in countering disinformation, the Taiwanese government has become more aware of the harm of disinformation as an occurrence of high profile cases has also led to the acknowledgement from society. So, I mean, the Taiwanese government, these preconditions made the niche of intervention possible. But the public sector and civil society actors have mostly worked in a parallel manner without close uh, collaboration, as they have occasionally benefited from another efforts. Uh, society actors may cite the definition of disinformation coined by the, uh, the disinformation coordination team there in the government. And the society, uh, but sometimes the government will cite all these non-government organizations' work but they don't have official relationship. Uh, the, but there should there could be some backfire because through the approaches such as like humor over rumor, that's one of the principles established by our government. The 222 principle means that you have to reply responsive in two hours and within only 200 characters, something like that. The government can swiftly deliver debunking messages to the public. But, but while these approaches are effective at the very beginning and might be duplicated in other countries, they sometimes backfire because rushing out debunking messages without prudent measures because they want to uh, they want to debunk it in two hours, right? So that may lead to the erosion of public trust. So, for example, the government once provided the response materials containing factual errors, and in another incident, the government provided materials to one pro-government online influencer, and the influencer released the material actually before the government did which further led to the critics of favoritism and outrageous like, propaganda among the public. So I think, uh, I mean, apart from this like unique characteristic of our own experience, Taiwan faces challenges similar to those of other countries in terms of countering disinformation. So first, the resistance to stronger regulations and further disclosure from social platform is still strong. And many countries like Taiwan have little leverage to negotiate with these platforms. And so I think exploring more innovative policy options and building cross-country policy consensus is kind of necessary for making substantial negotiation between governments and social platforms. And I think EU mm, should play a role here, I guess. And secondly, our governmental agencies, especially law enforcement and the court, really lack the capacity to counter this information, sometimes even being resistant to dealing with it. And I think this obstacle remains addressed, especially by some of the reports that are generated by Taiwan. So... I think I talked this for too long, but that's my brief answer. <laughs> Thank you. I would come back to Marketa. Uh, Marketo, you have also worked a lot on uh, surveillance, meaning on looking into how governments and basically totalitarian or authoritarian regimes can actually misuse their powers again their, against their own population, but also against foreign audiences like Chinese Russian government against us in Europe or against those in Taiwan, for example. Uh, and at the same time, you have done a lot of, I would say, good political work on dual use technologies. So could you maybe briefly tell us about what you are trying to achieve there which on the surveillance part and on the dual use technology part because i know it's slightly away from the issue of disinformation but it's very much connected to like personal freedoms which we are discussing about 
Yes, well, uh, my pleasure to talk about it. And uh, actually, surveillance and dual use uh, regulation in the EU are very closely related because uh, we updated existing dual use regulation to broaden the scope of it on these technologies, such as the surveillance, biometric surveillance mostly, and well, anything related to, to cybersecurity. So, uh, so this is actually very connected. And I am happy to say that uh, we managed to uh, to finish uh, the update of the regulation. So it actually took place already in September. So now what it does is that it shouldn't, uh, the EU countries or the EU companies should not export uh, such technologies to countries where uh, it uh, is, uh, when, when there is a potential that it will be used to uh, abuse human rights uh, or, you know, to in any way, um, well, abuse the technologies uh, by the uh, by the uh, well uh, the one who receives the item. It's usually governments, of course, but it can be, of course, even uh, private uh, entities. Uh, right now, it's only from uh, European Union countries to the countries outside of the EU. Uh, so, of course, it's not about what uh, we import, uh, but it's also a very important step uh, in not sharing our know-how with such countries. Because there is one thing that, you know, for example, and it, let's just use it as an example, I'm not saying that this is really happening, uh, that some company, for example, Netherlands, is creating emotion recognition software. And one thing is that it won't uh, export the software now uh, to China, where we can quite uh, assume that it will be used against the citizens uh, uh, in the surveillance that is going on or in specific ethnics or specific, uh, you know, segments of the citizens. Uh, but it also means that they won't be able to learn from our software how it is made and maybe even improve it or put it into their systems and what they already have. So uh, this not sharing our um, parts of technological advancement is very important uh, outcome of the regulation, even if it's not like written directly in it. And this also, of course, affects uh, all the other uh, like countries around uh, around China and uh, uh, countries with malicious intents. Uh, of course, it's not just about uh, surveillance technologies, dual use items for those of, uh, for those listeners who don't know are items that can have both civilian and military purposes. So, of course, even some chemicals uh, are uh, under that or I don't know, I like to use the example of drones, you know, but uh, I don't want people to think that dual use technologies are only drones. Uh, but there, there are plenty of items and this just broadened the scope and also definitions. So the, this is done and I am very happy for that. Uh, it's uh, of course not, uh, not a final win. Uh, because there are still companies that will uh, export it uh, via, you know, third countries and uh, we will still have to follow the process of the export itself and there is a lot of work there. But what it also, also does, and that's maybe important if any uh, NGOs or activists are listening to us today, uh, uh, the... As it is written, the regulation, uh, it vastly helps uh, journalists and NGOs and watchdog organizations to track uh, such items because uh, there should be uh, there should be an annual list of such exports uh, where it went etc and people in those countries can then you know uh, uh, check with respective entities uh, whether this really came there or whether they uh, resold it uh, resold it or what happened to it and they can actually easily track what happened right now it's also possible but usually only the most investigative journalists with the biggest networks of contacts in various countries could track such exports. Now with this regulation, it should help. So it's kind of, for me, it's kind of sad to say we improve the regulation so that people can check on it better because I think the regulation should be in itself uh, the thing that does it. But it's a matter of compromises in politics. So I'm at least happy that we could help in this regard. 
Thank you. I have one more question and then I have time uh, to ask both of you if you want to ask yours each other on something specifically. Uh, but my my last question, let's say, goes to Puma. And uh, Puma, I would like to ask if you could briefly describe what your think tank, Double Think Lab, what, what you are actually doing, what your team does, and where potentially you think there could be something what European countries, democracies, be it politicians like Marketa or civil society organizations, what they could actually bring bring and help Taiwan with if there is something what you think actually makes sense because I think the political relations between specific European democracies and institutions like the European Parliament are actually warming up will be much better in, in upcoming months and years so now it's time for the, the, the gifts and start thinking about what actually do we want to do together or share for example so Puma what are your thoughts please uh, sure. So I just briefly uh, introduced our the organization or the organization I work on uh, is Double Think Lab. So uh, there are like several we got several teams in Double Think Lab. Uh, one of them we focus a lot on uh, on the digital footprint of all this disinformation. So we try to archive all this data there in China and also the data here in Taiwan, so we can analyze like um, where does the message coming from, um, and uh, what's the writing style of it. Uh, what's the motivation for some of the nodes or some of the payers who disseminated this kind of disinformation? So that's one thing. And the other group of people, we focus a lot on the victims. So the one I just mentioned is that we try to determine like which group of uh, which group of people are more vulnerable than the other. And we actually conducted several psychological experiment on them and see. Uh, after reading all this, uh, like 130 conspiracy theories generated by China and whether they believe it or not, something like that. And we also have a legal team which focus a lot on uh, the, the legal advocacy and see what we can do for the legal system. And for example, we are trying to push the law such uh, very similar to FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, or we try to or we try to ask the parliament if they can authorize certain department to investigate the money flow, something like that. And also we got another team which works, at, uh, works on the global index. So right now we're trying to see if we can develop some sort of index to raise the awareness around the world and see which country has been uh, infiltrated, infiltrated the most by China, like even in military domain or foreign policy domain, the media domain. Uh, we categorize there are nine different domains that have been infiltrated a lot by the United Front War Department there in China. And I think it's kind of important because when we, when we look at all this online, this information, we always like use the, the Russia framework, try to analyze what's happening there in China. But I think China is really good at spreading rumors offline, especially approaching like younger generation, having all the patriots for them to China. And also, uh, for example, there are like uh, 2000 districts here in Taiwan and each district, we have a local chief, the leader. And they try to approach all these leaders and see whether they can spread this information just by rumor. Uh, by word of mouth and there's nothing you can really stop it because they're making they're just making friends and but they're joining all these chat groups all these private facebook groups and generating all these kind of rumors all together so i think it's kind of crucial for especially there in europe to see what's really happening especially by the behavior all these activities generated by united front war department or the cppcc i think they are the main player who will deliver the main order from top down i think i, I think they're the main player from top down and deliver the message and see what's what will other groups of people or other departments there in China should do in the near future. And also we should like really, uh, because when we talk about investigating all the money flow, including not just the donation, but also all this money coming from, uh, from China to the disseminators or the creators of this information. But without, I mean, all this international collaboration, there's no way that we can find this all this money flow. So I think it's kind of important to have this kind of legal approach that if we can collaborate all together and see, uh, especially for the uh, especially for the social media platform, because all these donations, I mean, mostly coming from the social media platform, and there's no regulations on that. So for example, when all the live streamers or the influencers doing all the live streaming here in Taiwan, they're providing the QR code actually for Chinese people to donate them. 
And but because but there is no regulation because the the I mean like YouTube they will never reveal whether this money is coming from China or whether it's coming from Japan or from the US, right? So if there's no pressure on all these social media platform, there's nothing we can do because Taiwanese government has very less leverage to negotiate or to talk to talk with all these social media platforms and say, hey, we should do this, we should do that. And even when we we, we because we're try to getting more data from social media platforms. So that's the way we can um, do all this analysis. But as you may know, because sometimes some media, social media platforms, I, I, I won't say which one, but they will close the access because you're saying, you're talking about all this illegal or like inauthentic behavior on their media platform and they're reluctant for you uh, for us to reveal this kind of activities. But we really rely on the data they provided, right? So if they, if there's a law asking them to provide all this data, even for the researchers or nonprofit groups or even for the academics, and we can analyze what uh, this information campaign look like on the social media platform, that would be very, very helpful. And I think EU or the US government has more power than us to negotiate with all these social media platforms. And that's one thing I think uh, maybe EU can do in this case. I don't know whether it's much burden for that, but that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. I will basically make it into a question to Marketa because EU pressure on the social media platforms like Facebook and Google and others is, I think, very significant, uh, fortunately. And I think that's where the EU is very good at, including the focus on privacy rules, or privacy uh, rights as well, uh, which where I think the EU is essentially a global leader, which the United States is not actually on privacy issues. So that's something where you can play a good role. So, Marketo, you are also in part of these, these political discussions in Brussels, inside of the EU institutions. So, is there something you see as well? And one more thing, if you could have a question to Puma as well, if there is something you are interested in. Thank you. Well, I was actually partially interested in exactly this, uh, but I might come up quickly with another question, because the topic of the cooperation with the biggest companies uh, that are especially based in US is uh, very important because uh, at one hand you could say well they are based in the US and they have a huge influence so they could actually not care about any kind of pressure from Chinese side and could help but also on the other hand we all know that they are not really um, uh, you know, pursuing some societal responsibility. They are pursuing uh, uh, money. <laughs> and uh, that's completely understandable because that's uh, that's a business model they work on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's important to talk about this. And uh, well, as for regulation, I, I will start with saying that uh, that there is no uh, uh, secrecy about the fact what is the European Commission currently doing. Uh, it's currently issuing voluntary um, codes of conduct and such, uh, so that it also sees where are the real limits of the uh, of the companies to voluntarily to voluntarily do something. And once we know where are the voluntary limits, we can set up a legislation surrounding that and also add some things that, uh, you know, of course, the companies will kick against. However, it, will, it won't be like a package of something completely unacceptable to them. Uh, and I think this is quite a clever approach. And I think this is also partially uh, what, you know, even smaller governments can try to uh, negotiate with, like saying, uh, you know, we have this kind of uh, codes of conduct or rules. Do you want to please, kindly please uh, uh, try to follow them? And usually they say like, uh, OK, because they are, to be honest, also happy not, not to be in complete complete legal vacuum because it harms them too. They never wanted to have this kind of responsibility, you know, so they actually appreciate some kind of lead. Uh, they just uh, don't want it to be narrowing from them for them, uh, but I think there it, there lies a compromise between these two uh, approaches. So that would be my take on it from what I've seen so far in the EU. Even though, of course, I understand that the EU is in a different position with its uh, uh, with its uh, scope. On the other hand, you know, we are still 27 countries, not, uh, you know, one federation. So uh, it's also not like um, the, the we, we have the power. We, we just don't often know how to use it. But maybe that, that time will come. And as for a question, well, 
because I wanted to ask about this, I will maybe slightly, uh, uh, you know, dive from the topic of disinformation, if you don't mind. If you do, please let me know, and I will try to come up with another question. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I expect uh, that when I talk to uh, potential, you know, official Taiwanese representatives on the highest level that I will see, uh, that I will hear a lot of diplomatic answers. That's why I also want to ask you, because I, I do hope that we don't have to do this here. And I want to know what, what's your opinion about the EU's one China policy. And uh, if you don't want to talk about it, you don't no, have you to. You don't have to. <laughs> and and uh, uh, yeah, Kuba, if you want to switch off your mic. No problem. I had the echo. And uh, of course, uh, whether, you know, you are not a very fan, big fan of it, uh, which is completely understandable, what would be, what would you think that is the best solution for Taiwan right now? Thanks. So, I mean, politics is not really my expertise, but if you ask me like my own opinion, uh, because I'm a very Taiwanese independent supporter, so I'm not really a big fan of one China policy, of course. But I think what we can do right now, I mean, along the way is, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but like double recognized. So which means that you recognize uh, China, but you also recognize Taiwan uh, simultaneously. So, but I mean, one thing to do that is that because we still have our official name as Republic of China, which is really complicated. Confusing. So, but if we are changing our name to Taiwan and we are facing a lot of resistance domestically here in Taiwan, and I think that's the obstacle. So I, I, I believe that there are like several countries already recognize us only as Taiwan, but not as Republic of China. So I think maybe in the future, if we can have double recognition from uh, aside from one China, you can say we got one China policy, but also we got one Taiwan policy. Right, so there's one Taiwan, one China, and there's no confusion. <laughs> I mean, that's the goal. But because I'm not, I'm not the expertise on this, but that would be my own, my own opinion on that. Thank you. And if I may quickly jump in before Kuba also uh, takes over, uh, I will just tell you based on your answer, uh, a little little fun note. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Czech Republic uh, faces uh, a lot of harassment from uh, the Chinese side too. And on our Twitter, there actually started to be a running joke uh, to call China uh, the Western Taiwan. So I don't know if this humors you, but I really like it. <laughs> We know I, that. We know I that. Mean, that I mean, they're <laughs> they're really creative here. <laughs> thank you. Thank to both both of you. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I have one question to both of you, uh, and that basically goes right into heart of this, which is if you could think about where would you like to be five years from now. So now is 2021. Let's say 2026. Five years from now. How do you think the EU-Taiwan relations should look like? I mean, could be in the area of disinformation or focus on counter, countering authoritarian activism or activities by countries like China. But where do you like to be in five years from now? Maybe, Puma, I would start with you, if I may, and then my Marketa would finish it off. Sure, I think it's a very tough question for me. <laughs> uh... It's like it really depends on China. I mean, uh, there might be, I think something might happen in 2023, right? When Xi Jinping wants to have the, his third renation. So uh, if something really happened in 2023 and everything would be different in five years. So I, I think it really depends on the domestic tension there in China. And what we may know that, uh, because when I talk about like communist youth of league, they used to spread this information actually is different from the disinformation generated by the central government there in China. But they have been really, their disinformation has been united uh, after, I think, in May this year. So which means the domestic politics has been changing there in China. And also because they are really uh, interested in the military invasion to some of the islands around Taiwan. So if that happens, uh, I think the public anger or something mm, or the public awareness on China might be very different from now. Still, because... Uh, China, because pro-China messages really has no market here in Taiwan. So it looks like, I mean, literally people do not like uh, do not like China. But still, because China is really good at spreading all these anti-US, anti-Japan messages, or maybe even anti-EU. So I will, I will expect when the EU-Taiwan relationships become like 
much better from now on. There will be a lot of like anti-EU messages, uh, especially in Chinese speaking world. So if people that are consuming this kind of messages, they already are anti-US or anti-Japan, they might be anti-EU, I mean, in the near future. And that's the threat and that's the risk that we should we should face, I mean, I think in the next five years. So that's, I mean, according to my expertise, that's something I think might happen in the near future. Thank you, Puma. And Marketo, can I ask you to finish it off What where you would like to be in five years from now? Of course. Well, in terms of this information, I, I will talk a little bit less uh, uh, like, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I will talk a little bit, bit less uh, about what uh, uh, is very pragmatically realistic and talk more uh, like an idealist which I kind of am. Uh, so I, I will say that in terms of disinformation, I do hope that both the EU and Taiwan will be able to uh, share more know-how even now, uh, even than now. And uh, that, you know, probably the EU will also have its uh, own legislation already done. And in that case, of course, that we will be able to help with persuasion of the uh, corporations, the transnational corporations, in terms of how they should be behave towards democracies in general. So that is my wish uh, for the disinformation part and for the EU-Taiwan relations in general. Well, I do hope that uh, in five years uh, uh, that, uh, you know, Taiwan will be considered an autonomous country. I will say directly, I do think in five years it's a completely viable option. And also that there will be a booming, you know, trade with a free trade agreement, uh, which will happen much sooner than the EU-Chinese free trade agreement. Well, yeah, that's my wish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I think it was a very good discussion uh, and uh, we will follow up on more because I think there will be more events and activities between EU and Taiwan coming up maybe in a couple of days and weeks as well. Uh, so thanks to both of you. Uh, this event was organized by European Value Center for Security Policy, also with the kind support of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. So thanks to both of you. I think we'll be seeing each other a lot online and also in person as well. So have a good evening to Taipei, have a good, let's say, day to Brussels and Prague as well. So good to see you and good to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you very much for Thank the invitation. You. Hi. Thank you. Thank you.